The 19th century was a heyday of medicines, of snake oil salesmen and quacks, all promising remarkable results while replacing the village apothecary. This was also a time way before Big Pharma was investing millions researching and developing medicines that targeted and treated specific illnesses. It was also a time before that 1968 Trade Descriptions Act prevented manufacturers from making misleading claims. This was also the perfect time for, okay, this is not safe. So it was the perfect time for someone to come along offering the miracle cure all. This was the era of the stomach. It was widely believed that the gut was connected to everything. And so swallowing a pill would obviously fix you up. The guy with this cure, this guy, Thomas Holloway. Now, Holloway was no pioneering physician. In fact, he distrusted the profession immensely. His genius lay in marketing. In the early days of trading, his brother would go into chemists and ask for Holloway's pills. When told they didn't stock them, he'd make a huge scene. Holloway would then later arrive, make easy sales. What his pills contained was rhubarb, cinnamon, cardamom, ginger, and saffron. And there is no way that they did everything he claimed. What they were was a pretty potent laxative, which, you know, sometimes that can help. Other ingredients such as glauber's salt and potassium sulfate definitely had an evacuating effect. What this all speaks to is the Victorian obsession with the stomach. And there could have been a placebo effect happening too. This was also a golden age of newspapers, which Holloway used to reach millions. His products were aggressively marketed with bold claims and glowing testimonials. Now, he didn't just restrict himself to Britain either. He sent thousands of letters overseas to discover the names of ever more papers to carry his advertisements. Holloway became one of the first truly global brands with adverts appearing across the British Empire and the United States. Billboards were seen at Niagara Falls and even at the foot of the Great Pyramids of Giza. His ads were plastered across the sides of trams and featured on collectible cards and trade tokens. With this strategy, he amassed an enormous fortune. I know what you're thinking, Holloway must have been loaded to get a statue of himself and to build his very own Chateau de Chambord. You're not wrong, but he didn't actually come from money. His father was originally a baker, and in his teenage years, he assisted his father in a pub and helped his mum in a grocer's shop. So the money for all of this came from his medicines. At age 28, Holloway left home, spending several years in northern France. On his return, he set up a not-so-successful trading business in London, and so had to supplement his income by working as an interpreter in a nearby hotel. It was there, in 1837, that he met an ointment salesman from Turin, Felix Albanolo. The story goes that Holloway, inspired by Albanolo, began producing his own universal family ointment by mixing the ingredients in his mother's bathtub. Now, after obtaining testimonials from a number of eminent London medical men, he offered to go into partnership with Albanolo, but he failed to raise the capital to do so. The men became rivals, and Holloway turned to newspapers to begin advertising his ointments in the Sunday Times and other London papers. But soon afterwards, hostile accounts accused Holloway of stealing Albanolo's formula, and the two men bankrupted themselves in the advertising battle that followed. Holloway was committed to debt as prison, and was only released thanks to financial help from his mother. Sales of his ointment were initially disappointing, and so in 1839, Holloway began manufacturing pills using a hand-operated machine. Holloway had so much faith in advertising that his marketing budget kept going up and up, starting at £1,000 in 1838, going up to £30,000 by 1855, and finishing at a staggering £50,000 by the time of his death in 1883. But the strategy paid off, resulting in huge sales and profits, and making Holloway one of the richest men in Britain. But what to do with all that money? As Holloway and his wife Jane didn't have any children, the couple looked towards philanthropy as a way to ensure a legacy. The culmination of this came in 1885 with the opening of Holloway Sanatorium in Virginia Water. 
The following year, Queen Victoria presided over the opening of his college, naming it Royal Holloway College. Both gifts to the nation addressed primarily middle-class concerns. The sanatorium was explicitly designed to cater for the professional breadwinner whose income ceases when he is unable to work. Similarly, Holloway College promised the daughters of middle-class families an education meant for more than simply becoming a governess. Holloway's legacy survives, not for the curative power of his pills, but for the institutions he founded, especially the college which continues to grow. Tragically though, Holloway wouldn't live to see either project completed. The son of a baker died on the 26th of December, 1883, just three years before his college was officially opened by the Queen.